Welcome everyone. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Anna and I'm a senior marketing specialist at the University of Tartu and today I will be your host. I am very happy to welcome you to our Alumni Talks 2023 event. And this is our new series of uh, webinars where our fantastic alumni share their stories of studying at the University of Tartu and also give a short lecture on the topic they have selected. And today with me, I have Merit, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who completed her master's in Estonian and Finno-Ugric linguistics. Uh, now Merit is a doctoral student and junior research fellow at the University of Tartu, and her research focuses on uh, Inari Sami, a uh, severely endangered Finno-Ugric minority language, which, had, which has recently been uh, successfully uh, revitalized. So her talk today is going to uh, have a title, University of Tartu, the best place in the world for studying Estonian and Finno-Ugric languages. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, small technical stuff. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please leave your questions under Q&A box. And then at the end of the webinar, we are going to address them. If you have any technical issues, please also let us know and we will try to resolve them as soon as possible and or as soon as we can. Uh, also, this webinar is recorded and we are going to email you the recording after the webinar as well. So I guess I'm done with all of my uh, technical remarks. Uh, so we can start with uh, the talk. Merit, the floor is yours. You can share your slides as well. So can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Anna, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, so as Anna already introduced me, uh, my name is Merit. Uh, I'm a doctoral student and also a junior research fellow uh, in Sami languages at the Institute of Estonian and General Linguistics at the University of Tartu. And uh, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, my own studies, my experiences um, and my work. Uh, and I will try to make a point of uh, why uh, the University of Tartu is such a good place uh, to study Estonian and also other finno languages. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is, first of all, my own um, background, um, my studies and uh, my research and my work. So what brought me to Tartu and um, how did I end up uh, doing research on a Sami language uh, at the University of Tartu? and also uh, some other projects that I'm involved with. And then I will shortly introduce uh, the new master's program. Uh, so the program is called Estonian and finno ugric Languages. And I also have to say that this is not the program that I graduated from. So um, this program only exists since this year, um, since 2000, or this academic year, since 2022. Um, and I um, graduated from a similar program, uh, which is called uh, Estonian and finno linguistics and is taught in um, Estonian. So those are, those are two different programs, but they, they're um, content-wise very similar. And then I will, uh, in the end, also point out uh, all the possibilities that there are uh, within the university, uh, but also outside the university when you come here um, to study Estonian and finno languages. Uh, so first, uh, a bit about my, my own background and uh, my research and work. Uh, so um, I'm originally from Germany. Um, I mean, I, I do have some, some uh, connection to Estonia. I didn't end up uh, in Tartu by coincidence. Uh, my mother is actually Estonian. Um, actually, my parents met at the University of Tartu. Um, and, but I myself, uh, I grew up in Germany um, and I had all of my school education there. And I only came to Estonia after high school. And I actually originally came um, to Tartu uh, to work in a field that is totally unrelated to linguistics and languages. So um, here on this picture, you can see me working um, in the National Archives of Estonia. So when I came to Tartu, I had this uh, idea that um, I want to become um, a conservator and restorator of uh, archival artifacts. 
So this is what I was, um, the field that I was working in uh, for a year um, in Tartu. And during this year, um, I mean, I already had some kind of interest in, in linguistics in general, and uh, especially in this uh, smaller Finno Greek languages. And then I sort of just met the right people uh, who got me even more interested in, in um, all of this. And uh, then I just decided, okay, I want to try for myself. And then I applied for um, bachelor's studies at the University of Tartu in um, Estonian and Finno Greek linguistics. So I ended up doing uh, both um, my bachelor's and my master's at the University of Tartu. And um, well, while I was only enrolled in the University of Tartu throughout this whole time, I actually also spent uh, one year at uh, the University of Oulu in Finland and one semester uh, in Hungary at LT University in Budapest. So while I only studied in Tartu, I, was, I also had some experience studying abroad. So um, in my bachelor's, I was in Finland and in my master's, I was in Hungary. So I, I, can, I have some kind of comparison to other universities as well. Um, and then after I graduated from my master's, um, I started my doctoral st studies in 2020. And then a year later, I became a junior research fellow in Sami languages, uh, also at the University of Tartu. Um, now, I didn't know what kind of uh, background you have, so I just have some very general information. Um, I hope it's uh, not too general, um, just because um, in the program's name, uh, we have Finno Greek languages, but actually this is only one sub branch um, of this bigger fam family, uh, which is called Uralic languages. So often we use Uralic and Finno Greek in this context as synonyms. Um, but yeah, so basically <laughs> there is this very um, by the broader fam language family of Uralic languages, and then Finno Greek is um, one of the major branches within this language family. And as you can see on this map here, um, the languages are spoken in a very wide area. Um, and um, well, many of these languages are spoken in rather large areas, but uh, of course they only have, well, majority of them only have very few speakers. So the, the population is quite scarce. Um, and you can see um, Estonia is here and here are the Sami languages. So um, this is the language group that I'm working uh, with the most. Um, and you can also see uh, on this map that they are the westernmost branch of this whole language family, um, geographically speaking. And well, <laughs> how did I end up uh, doing research in Sami languages? So um, as I already mentioned, I spent a year in Oulu um, in Finland, uh, which is here. So it's actually not even in the uh, very north of uh, uh, Finland, but like basically geographically speaking, it's, it's sort of exactly in the middle of uh, Finland. Um, and uh, there they have uh, an institute for, for Sami languages. And this is where I had the chance to learn more about Sami languages and also uh, learn uh, some Sami myself. And uh, then I ended up writing uh, my bachelor thesis on one of the Sami languages. And Afterwards, also my master thesis, um, and then uh, also now uh, during my doctoral studies, I'm doing research on on a Sami language. And um, well, as you can see on this map, uh, there's actually ten different Sami languages which are spoken in this area from uh, Norway and Sweden uh, in the west to the Kola Peninsula in Russia in the east. And uh, the language that I'm working with is Anar or Inari Sami which is spoken here, so in uh, the northernmost part of Finland. And all of these uh, languages are rather small. <laughs> so uh, the biggest of them is, uh, are like speaker-wise, uh, is the North Sami, uh, which has about uh, 20,000 speakers, and it's spoken in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. But most of the other languages, they only have a couple of thousand or a couple of hundred speakers, or even just a couple of speakers. Uh, so these are all endangered languages, um, like many other uh, Finno Greek languages, um, except for well, the official languages, Finnish, Hungarian, and, and Estonian, who are who have their own states. Um, now, just uh, some a bit of background on the language that I'm working with. So uh, Anar Sami or Inari Sami, uh, as I already said, it's spoken uh, in the northernmost part of uh, Finland, uh, in a municipality called Inari, 
Uh, so there's this uh, big lake there, which is called Anar uh, in um, Anar Sami or Inari in Finnish. And there's this municipality around it with several villages. And this is where this language was originally spoken. Uh, but of course, nowadays, many speakers uh, have moved elsewhere um, for work reasons or for um, personal reasons. Um, so, for example, um, some live in Helsinki or other bigger cities. Um, and you might wonder about these two names, Anar or Inari. Uh, this is because in um, Anar Sami, in the language itself, uh, the lake is called Anar and the language is called Anarashkele, based on that. Uh, but in Finnish, uh, it, it's called Inari and Inari in Same. Um, so depending on what, what language you follow, um, you can use both Anar Sami or Inari Sami. Um, I personally, uh, in recent times, have preferred Anar Sami, but um, they both refer to the same language. And it's the only Sami language that is spoken only in Finland. Um, there are two other Sami languages also spoken in Finland, which are North Sami and Skold Sami, uh, which are both closely related to Anar Sami. Uh, but those are also spoken in other countries. So uh, North Sami is also spoken um, in Sweden and Norway, as I said before, and Skold Sami is also spoken in Russia. And well, the language uh, has never been really big. It has never had many speakers. It is thought that there have never been more than a thousand of Anar Sami speakers. However, uh, the language got uh, even more endangered uh, in the last century. And nowadays, uh, the estimated number of speakers is 450, um, which includes also non-native speakers. Now, there are uh, three major factors that are often pointed out, which have uh, played a role in the endangerment of the language. So uh, often the root is seen in the rising nationalism of the uh, 19th century. So there was this um, uh, idea to have this common uh, Finnish identity and Sami people who, who spoke completely different languages had a different culture. They just didn't fit into this general picture. So uh, this is when the sort of negative attitude towards them uh, uh, sort of started. But then uh, the actual assimilation politics, they only started in the last century. So one of the biggest changes was in the field of education. Uh, when um, in the beginning of the last century, uh, the school system was changed. So before there were uh, these local schools in the Sami areas where uh, children had the chance to um, study or learn in, in their own native languages. But then those were uh, replaced by national schools um, where the language of instruction was finished and uh, the Sa Sami children were even forbidden to to use their own mother tongue in um, among themselves uh, inside the school. Um, and because those schools were not uh, that close to the areas where the Sami people were living, uh, the children were actually forced to uh, go to the boarding schools and live there. So what happened is that they were taken away from the families, they had to go to the boarding schools and there they were not allowed to use their own language, so they were just forced uh, to uh, switch to Finnish instead. Uh, and then uh, there was also another setback, uh, which was happened during the Lapland War, during the Second World War. So um, in September 1944, uh, many people from, uh, from this municipality were evacuated to southern parts of Finland and also to Sweden. And uh, because a lot of the, many, many of the buildings in this area were destroyed, uh, many of them, they just didn't have a place to go back to. So they stayed in this uh, southern parts of Finland or in Sweden where they were evacuated to, and they just never came back. And there they just assimilated to, to the local culture. Um, so this uh, all resulted to the situation uh, when in the 1980s, there were only two families left where the children would still speak the language. Um, but then uh, slowly the revitalization process of Anar Sami started. So there were some uh, language activists, native speakers of the language, who wanted to change something about the situation. And uh, the biggest first milestone was uh, when they opened the Anar Sami language nest. So in this language nest, children whose parents uh, never learned the language uh, because their parents didn't speak it to them, they could uh, go to this um, language nest which was basically like a kindergarten, and the teachers there would talk to them uh, in Anar Sami. 
And that way the children whose parents didn't speak the language, the children could learn the language. Uh, and then uh, when these children became older and they were about to go to school, then uh, also uh, a Sami group, uh, an Anna Sami group was uh, uh, founded at the local primary school. So children actually could continue even their school education and the language. And nowadays it's uh, possible to um, study the language up to the um, highest education level. So also at university, um, there has been, for example, also even a doctoral defense, which took place in Anar Sami. Uh, so the uh, thesis itself was not written uh, in the language, but the defense took place in Anar Sami. Uh, so, so basically the, the use of the language has uh, become, an, become a lot bigger. bigger. Uh, and well, one of the problems that they uh, faced at some point was that uh, while there were again children speaking the language, there still was this problem of their parents not speaking the language. So you had the other speakers who still learned the language and knew the language, and uh, you had the new children, the young generation who now again spoke the language, but there was this whole generation in between who didn't learn the language from their parents. And uh, this generation has been uh, referred to as the lost generation. And to address this problem, uh, they um, introduced language classes uh, for adults. So they had, for example, this one year long intensive courses that people could attend to learn the language. And there are also courses offered uh, at the university, for example, in Oulu. Uh, and this uh, in turn resulted in a, a very big number of non-native speakers. So um, as I said, uh, the language nowadays has 450 speakers, but this also includes uh, exactly those non-native speakers. Um, so um, while there's very few speakers, uh, the picture in general is very heterogeneous. So there's uh, it's different generations who have learned the language in different ways. Um, and there's a lot of variation going on in the language. And you can basically also see that there's the language is changing, um, of course, also partly due to the um, influence from Finnish, which has been there for a, a very long time. Um, and this is what I'm interested in in my research. So more specifically, I'm looking at the grammar of the language and uh, how uh, it varies and how it has changed in the course of this whole uh, revitalization um, process. Um, well, the working project, uh, working um, title of my uh, pro PhD project is uh, Morphosyntactic Variation and Change in Anar Sami. Um, now, uh, in addition to my own project, I'm also uh, related to some other uh, or associated to some other projects at the university. Um, one of them is um, the uh, project on uh, Anasami prosody and morphology. So I myself, in my own research project, I'm looking more at the grammar of the language, but in this project, I'm actually together with um, phoneticians of our institutes uh, who look at uh, a different um, subfield of linguistics um, in, in this language. So I'm basically there um, functioning as a language expert. Uh, and then uh, I'm also um, working for uh, this project, uh, which uh, is the development of uh, URATIP, which is uh, the typological database of Uralic languages. So um, this is actually uh, a project that started long before I joined. Uh, I only joined very recently. And um, basically it's a, a very, um, it's uh, a database that has uh, all different uh, Uralic languages and uh, is, uh, has different questions. For example, um, as you can see here, a question like, are there prepositions? Uh, and then for each language, you get different values, either it's yes or no. Um, and then you can, uh, when you go to this website of the project, you can uh, have these really <laughs> nice visual maps of uh, how these different features are distributed in the uh, different languages. Um, so for example, um, here for the prepositions, you can see that there is uh, this very clear cut between the languages on um, in the West and the languages in the East. So these are um, the languages for which the question or the answer to the question is yes. So they have prepositions and those are the languages that don't have prepositions. So this is a, a database that has um, like these different kinds of um, features listed for different uh, Uralic languages. And um, now, uh, now the goal um, of our project 
of our current project is to add even more languages and to also add examples to all of these um, questions or features that are listed in, in this database. Uh, I am also um, working as a translator um, besides uh, or outside of the university. Um, I that's of course also somewhat related to, to what I have studied because I studied languages, um, but maybe not so much to what I focus on because um, I'm usually translating into German and not to <laughs> not to any Finnish language. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm translating from um, uh, Estonian um, and also Finnish. Um, but uh, besides that, I'm also an active member of uh, a non-governmental organization, which is called Hui Um And our goal is to raise awareness of Finnish peoples um, inside Estonia, um, especially among younger people. And we organize different kinds of projects, projects and also cultural events. And we often uh, work together with other organizations from Estonia, but also from abroad. And we have had different kinds of projects. This is just um, an example of what kind of things we do. So here you can see one of our members, uh, Anna Kutsnatsova, uh, who has um, herself uh, is of Komi origin. And here she is um, at a school, a local school in Tartu, uh, talking about Fino Greek peoples and uh, Komi uh, peoples, her own um, about her own background uh, to the children, just to um, kind of familiarize uh, them with this uh, with this Fino Greek people. So this is something that we have done. So we have been to schools talking to children about Fino Greek peoples, but we have also organized other um, other events and. Um, one thing that has uh, grown out of uh, of our NGO is uh, our band uh, called Geno Belgadi, and uh, this was formed together with other members of our, our organization. And basically, we perform songs in different Uralic languages. Uh, these are um, old folk songs, but also songs that we have written ourselves. And um, well, we basically for the um, the lyrics we. Um, well, if, if we can, we, we have written them ourselves, but we have also uh, used, for example, uh, poems from uh, different Finnogic languages. And uh, one thing that we have also done is that we have translated well-known songs uh, to Finnogic languages. So, for example, there is a very well-known Estonian song, uh, which is actually uh, not in the standard Estonian, but in, in Voro in Southern Estonian. And we did a uh, Komi version of it. So we had a, uh, a friend who is a native speaker of Komi language and uh, he translated it into Komi. And then we uh, recorded it and we uploaded it to YouTube. And then some time later it was uh, shown at the national television uh, in Komi Republic. So um, there was this <laughs> national television uh, that said, said like, oh, look at this, there's an Estonian band performing a song in Komi. And uh, this was actually quite surprising to us as well. And it's just such a great example of how, like in this, within this small Finno Greek world, like if you do something, um, you can reach a like a lot wider audience that you would ever expect yourself. Um, so yeah, as you can see from, from these uh, things, like um, many things of what I do in my everyday life, they're somewhat related to what I have uh, studied at the uh, university. Uh, now, a bit about our new master's program. Uh, so as I said before, uh, it's a new program. I have not studied it myself. I studied a similar program, uh, which was taught in Estonian. Um, but uh, this now is uh, taught uh, based on English, and it was opened only last year, 2022. So now the, the people who are studying in this program, they are actually the first ones uh, to ever study in this program. And uh, it's basically a program um, of linguistics uh, combined with uh, a lot of uh, practical language courses as well. And uh, within this program, there's two speciali specializations, so either Estonian or Finno Greek languages. But of course, that doesn't mean that um, that you're restricted to either one. So if you study Finno Greek languages, for example, you of course are very welcome to also study Estonian. And well, there are, of course, uh, modules on um, different fields of linguistics and also on um, computational linguistics, for example, and programming. So there is uh, also uh, this collaboration with um, 
digital humanities as well. And yeah, there is a wide range of uh, Finnovic languages that are taught at our institute, not only Estonian, but also um, other Finnovic languages. And um, the admission uh, requirements for this program are a bachelor's degree or something equivalent. Uh, and then, of course, sufficient English language proficient proficiency because the uh, whole program is taught in English. So you don't actually have to, to have any previous uh, knowledge of uh, Estonian, for example. Um, and the applications are evaluated based on a motivational letter and an interview, uh, which means that to study in the program, you don't actually need to have a background in linguistics. So, for example, if you come from a completely different field, but you are interested in Estonian or some other Finnogic language, then uh, this is the ideal program for you because um, you're not expected to have, uh, I mean, you can have a previous background in linguistics. Of course, that's uh, uh, very fortunate, but uh, you don't necessarily have to have um, a degree in linguistics um, to apply for this program. Uh, so the only thing that counts is, is your motivation uh, when applying. Uh, so, now uh, to the main topic of my talk. So why is uh, Tartu such a great place for, for studying Estonian Finnish languages? Um, as I said earlier, I want to talk about um, the possibilities uh, inside the university, as well as the opportunities outside the university. So, uh, first of all, um, as I already said, there are many different uh, Finnish languages that are taught at our institute. So, for example, uh, Finnish, Hungarian and Komi, uh, they are taught every semester um, by native speakers. And, uh, but there are also many other Finnish languages that are taught, some less frequently than others, but like every semester there are some courses that you can um, choose between. Uh, and I personally have, uh, during my studies in Tartu, I have studied uh, Finnish, uh, Hungarian, Komi, uh, Livonian, uh, Vuro, which is uh, Southern Estonian, uh, Ersa, Pita Sami, and Skol Sami. So those are the languages that I have studied in Tartu. Um, however, um, I, there was actually even more, so I didn't even um, use all the opportunities that I, I would have had to study. Um, so this is just an example of, of the different kinds of languages that, um, that are taught uh, at our institute. And of course, uh, there are also other languages that are taught at um, at our university. So um, there's also the Institute of Foreign Languages and Cultures, and uh, there are a wide range of different language courses. So these are not Finnogic languages, uh, except for Estonian, which is also taught there. Uh, but those are like any kind of other languages um, that you can study there. So I, for example, took some courses in, in Russian, Swedish, and Norwegian, uh, which for um, me were uh, useful uh, because when you work with Sami languages, for example, um, then of course some of the resources the, like articles, grammars are written in these languages because uh, the languages are also spoken in these areas in, in Sweden, Nor Norway and uh, Russia. Um, but of course there are also many other languages that are taught there. Um, and of course, uh, there is in, in the program, there is uh, different courses related to linguistics. Um, one point that I, or one thing that I wanted to point out is um, the possibility to take classes in computational linguistics and programming, um, which is something that I personally have found very useful. So I have um, taken a variety of courses in computational linguistics and programming, and this is, I, I got I have gotten some scripts from them from those courses that have been very useful. So um, in my research nowadays, like when um, I do some kind of data analysis, then I um, I apply all this knowledge that I got from these courses. So this is something that has been proved has proven very useful to me. Um, and also um, what I find really great and what I have always enjoyed is that um, when studying at the University of Tartu, then in uh, every program you have this kind of optional courses, um, which means that you can choose uh, or elect uh, courses from any other program that is offered at the university. Of course, there are some restrictions because for some courses you need previous knowledge uh, or they're just restricted to a certain group of students. 
but generally there are many courses that are open to just anyone uh, that you can take as an optional course. So for example, I mean, this is not related to my own research, but, basic, but uh, rather like um, a personal interest because um, I have this uh, German roots as well. I was interested in, um, in the history of the Baltic German, Germans and uh, things related to that. So I have used this opportunity to take some seminars about Baltic Germans, which were taught at the um, Department of German uh, Language. Um, so something that is completely unrelated to, to what I'm doing um, otherwise, but it just uh, took it out of personal interest. And I think that's also a really, really nice opportunity that the University of Tartu offers. Um, and yeah, when, when you are studying at the university, uh, it's often possible to get involved um, in the work of the researchers at the Institute. So um, I have to say that our Institute in general, compared maybe to some other fields or other universities abroad, it's probably rather small uh, or the number of students is rather small. Uh, but at the same time, this means that it's very personal. Uh, and it might happen that some, somebody just approaches you or there's some email in, in some mailing list that uh, somebody in some project is looking uh, for students to help out. And um, I, for example, when I was um, a master's student, I got involved in a project uh, on the automatic analysis of old Estonian texts. So those were um, texts from the 19th century, um, mostly, or they were actually were uh, courts, uh, records or proceedings and um, because they were not in a, in a standardized uh, language but they were like they were like uh, from different dialectal areas and they were all written in a non-standardized way so this automatic analysis was um, very hard of course to to program um, and um, though I got um, involved in this project when I was uh, in my master's studies and even right now when we have this um, project on the typological database of Uralic languages uh, there we actually also I mean I'm employed in this project but we also have some uh, for example master students and even bachelor students who are helping uh, out with this uh, project as well so they are looking for example sentences for all the features that we have in this different uh, Uralic languages and um, this is a great way uh, to I mean of course uh, you get paid for it, so it's a great way to earn money doing something that is related to your studies. But at the same time, it's a really nice way to um, to gain experiences and also to um, get connected to people. And then maybe later on you can stay in the project or work with the same people in, in a different project. So this is something that um, if you come to study at the University of Tartu and there's an opportunity like that, I very much uh, recommend you to, to use that opportunity. And then there are, of course, also uh, exchange programs with other universities. So as I said before, um, I myself went to Finland and also Hungary. Um, but of course, there are also other places that you could go to. So people from our institute, they usually or typically um, go to <clears throat> Finland, Hungary, Germany, Austria, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland uh, or Sweden. So these are the typical partner universities but um like even if you want to go to a completely different place uh, and there is no um there is no Erasmus agreement between um the university of Tartu and that place it's sometimes um possible to um just make a new agreement for you to be possible to um to have the possibility to go there um so in general i very much uh, recommend uh this opportunity as well so i mean for me personally it has um it has given me a lot because uh um i had the chance chance to um get more familiar with sami languages when i was at the university of oru and i mean i'm still working on a sami language so i don't think i would or i probably wouldn't be doing the same if i hadn't had the chance to to go there and also i really very much enjoyed my my exchange semester at elte in budapest uh just because i i had the chance to really improve my my Hungarian skills there um yeah there are also um summer courses <clears throat> so if you don't want to go somewhere for a whole semester um this is another opportunity how you can go abroad and um improve your language skills 
So there are um, every summer there are courses um, on Finnish and Hungarian, which are taught in Finland and Hungar Hungary. So I, for example, I have um, done both. I have been to Finland and uh, to Hungary for summer courses. And they are very intense, but they are also very, very useful. So for example, when I was in Hungary, I was there for four weeks in total, which is a very long time when you think um, about it, because we really had language classes every day from, from morning to afternoon, and we were in this Hungarian environment uh, the whole time. But it did so much for my language skills, like it just, uh, helped me so much. And um, then every couple of years, there's also the Livonian summer school. So this is not something that is um, organized as regularly, but it still takes place every couple of years. And it's um, a combination of language classes and also some cultural classes or um, um, classes on the history of Livonian and some cultural program as well. And it takes place on the Livonian coast. Um, and it's just, a, I very much recommend this as well if you're interested in smaller Finnogic languages and especially in Livonians, then it's um, it's just a really nice um, experience. It's just, it's a very beautiful place and um, they're very interesting um, uh, classes there. Um, and then the University of Tartu is also um, in this uh, partnership together with some other universities. Now this <laughs> partnership has had um, different names throughout the years. Um, so it used to be Infused and then Copios, um, and now it's called uh, Rimodos. And uh, also the number of universities has grown uh, since the beginning. But basically it's just this, um, now it is partnership between two, uh, between 10 different universities and they host uh, different academic events that are related to Uralic studies. Um, so for example, summer schools or winter schools or spring schools that usually last a week and there are like language classes or some um, something else related to Uralic studies um, to the field of uh, linguistics. And um, yeah, and uh, they also have uh, online classes sometimes. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of cooperation with other universities as well. And as a student, I would also very much recommend you to um, take part in conferences and other events. So uh, again, if something like that is organized in Tartu, then usually as a student, you will uh, get approached uh, by someone. Um, you might get uh, an email to some kind of mailing list that somebody is looking for volunteers um, for organizing a conference. And I think that's a very great way as a student to just get to know people of uh, your field. Uh, but at the same time, of course, you can also um, help talk um, at the conference yourself. Or if you don't feel that confident to go to one of those big con uh, conferences yet, uh, you can uh, just go to a student conference instead. So uh, these are actually very good. It's a, it's a very good way to um, practice uh, holding a talk in front of an audience um, when there's just other students sitting there. So it might seem less intimidating. And one of these um, bigger events for students, or actually the biggest event for uh, students in our field is uh, IFUSCO, which is the International Finno Greek Students Conference. And it's hosted uh, in a different place by a different university each year. So it's circulating and it's always in a different country. And uh, this picture was taken in 2018 when it was hosted by the University of Tartu. So here, this is actually in front of the main building of our university. Um, yeah, but it takes place every year um, in a different place. Now, uh, coming to uh, the possibilities outside the university. So uh, Tartu is actually um, quite a Finno Greek city. So of course, when you come to Estonia to study Estonian, then of course you will have uh, many chances to practice Estonian because there are a lot of people here who speak Estonian. Um, but it's not the only Finno Greek language that is spoken in Tartu. So um, there are, for example, uh, many Finns and Hungarians living in Tartu. So when I started uh, studying those languages at the university, for example, um they had this uh every week uh, all the local hungarians would meet uh, and also students of hungarian would meet and just um 
have like these Hungarian evenings where they would just talk in Hungarian. And that's just, this is again something that has helped me a lot to um, improve my language skills. Um, and they have similar events for, for Finnish as well. And then there was also um, many people from um, the Finno Greek areas in Russia who have come to Tartu, uh, for example, to study in their masters or uh, to do their PhD in Tartu and who have decided, decided to stay in, uh, in Estonia. So this picture is actually taken uh, from a Mari uh, event that was uh, that took place in uh, in Tartu. So there's like this small communities of different Finno Greek peoples who are living in Tartu and who sometimes organize different kinds of events that you can also attend as an outsider. So if you um, learn some kind of uh, Finno Greek language, um, it's generally very easy to um, to get to know this kind of people um, who are native speakers of the language and, and to um, yeah, just to become a part of this um, these communities as well. Uh, and then there are of course uh, many regular events that are um, hosted, um, for example, uh, related to Finnish language and culture, such, such as uh, concerts and exhibitions. So those are often organized by the Finnish Institute and also uh, at Tampere Maja. Um, and for several years now, there has been uh, Hungarian movie nights uh, every autumn, I think for four years, maybe now. Um, and they take, they are organized in uh, Elektri Theater, which is an art house cinema. And it's actually right um, behind um, the university's main building. So our institute is right next to the main building of the university. And then this uh, Elektri Theater is right behind the main building. So everything is very um, close by. And well, actually our lecture of Hungarian is, is um, very much uh, involved in, in organizing this uh, Hungarian movie nights. Um, then uh, another regular event uh, actually in the whole of Estonia is uh, the Kindred People's Days uh, called Huimobe Pavad in Estonia. Um, and this is actually a tradition that already started in the 1920s. But uh, during the Soviet times, of course, um, well, um, there was like during the Soviet times, there was a break. But uh, then after the re-independence, uh, again, um, uh, these kind of events were organized. So these are events related to Finno Greek peoples and cultures. Uh, and uh, since 2011, this is also a national holiday in Estonia. So every third Saturday of October is the Kindred People's Day. And nowadays, there are typically two main concerts, uh, one in Tallinn and one in Tartu. Uh, and there are also many other smaller events, uh, also in other places in Estonia, uh, but also especially in Tartu. Uh, and uh, for example, these are like also exhibitions or concerts or um, yeah, uh, similar events. And they um, often take place throughout the whole month of October. So uh, now we even talk about the Kindred, Pe Kindred People's Month because uh, this uh, whole thing has grown so big that you actually the whole of October is filled with uh, similar events. <clears throat> and here um, is a picture of uh, the main concert uh, last year in uh, Tartu. Um, well, this is actually our um, band uh, performing here. Uh, but there's uh, at this main um, concert, there are always many different kinds of bands uh, playing from different Finnogic regions. And of course, uh, the Estonian National Museum is also plays a very big part in, in Fino Ugrigness of uh, Tartu. So um, um, since it opened its new building in 2016, it now has uh, the biggest exhibition of Fino peoples worldwide. So there's two um, permanent exhibitions at the National Museum. One is about Estonians and Estonian history, uh, and the other one is about Fino peoples. And um, I very much recommend <laughs> to visit both of them, of course. And in addition to that, there is also a series of events that uh, are um, related to Finno Greek peoples. So there's this Huimoglobi, which means that uh, um, generally, typically every month, there is some kind of talk or concert that is um, related to some kind of Finno Greek topic. And this picture here, for example, um, was taken last um, last spring uh, when there was uh, this kind of um, 
event between uh, the people in Tartu and a small village in Udmurtia in, um, in one of the Finno uh, regions in Russia. And uh, basically we had a concert on spot and then they also made a concert for us. So basically the Udmurt people were playing for us and, and then people from Estonia were performing for them. And uh, we would watch uh, each other through um, this, um, well, with this hybrid solution through video through a video conference. So here you can actually see this um, small Udmurt uh, girl playing uh, this folk instrument, um, basically online. Um, so there was this kind of um, musical bridge, they called it. Um, but yeah, there have been different kinds of uh, events organized uh, within this series. And well, <laughs> uh, again, talking about events, uh, one of the biggest events in the Finnogic world is the World Congress of Finnogic Peoples, um, which is organized every four years. And two years ago, it took place in the Estonian National Museum in Tartu. And as you can see in this picture here, uh, one of the attendees was the former Estonian uh, president, Kersti Kaljulait. And lastly, I wanted to mention again um, one uh, major event uh, in this whole Finnogic world is the International Congress uh, for Finnogic Studies, uh, which again is this kind of traveling event, so it always takes place in a different um, place. And it's uh, the biggest uh, or the most important international academic event uh, for research that is connected to Finno Greek languages, uh, peoples, culture, and history. And it is held every five years. And the next one will actually take place in, in Tartu in 2025. And I think my, my time is over, but uh, thank you for listening and welcome to Tartu. <laughs> your passion to Finno Greek languages for showing uh, describing the program and also showing us the social life in uh, in Tartu. Uh, so you can stop sharing your screen and we can open the Q&A session. We have quite some questions but we are not going to be able to take all of them unfortunately due to the time but let's take at least some of them. Uh, so first question how much Estonian did you speak when you went to Estonia? Was it difficult to get used to everything language-wise? <laughs> um, I mean, I I actually um, um, when I was fourteen, I spent a year um, in Estonia. Um, I was there on a kind of school exchange, and that is when I learned to speak Estonian more fluently. So when I um, when I came to Estonia after high school, I already spoke the language. But of course, living there for a year before university also helped me a lot. Um, but still, it was it was a bit hard for me um, to in the beginning during my bachelor studies because I mean I chose a field uh, where I was together with uh, Estonian native speakers who were uh, studying Estonian linguistics. So. Um, I think I had a harder time than most other people there just because I didn't grow up in Estonia. I didn't get the, the same as Estonian education. Um, but I mean, this um, the new program is based on English. So if you come to, to study to um, Estonian or Estonian and Finno Greek languages in this new program, then you, do, you don't have to know Estonian um, in advance. Thank you so much, Merit. I guess we also covered this question because there was one of this question if uh, Estonian uh, proficiency is needed to apply for the program. So the answer would be no. Uh, next question. How would you compare different Sami languages? What are the biggest similarities and differences? <laughs> that's, that's a very uh, broad question. <clears throat> I mean, they're basically like a um, what we call a dialect continuum. So if you take, for example, Anar Sami and the ones that are next to it, then they are very similar to one another. But if you take one language from one end and compare it to the language from the very other end, then they're very different from one another. And I mean, this difference concerns different um, like uh, parts of the, of the language. So they're like um, on different languages, they can um, be about like phonetics and philology, but also about uh, grammar and grammatical structures. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess it's comparable to comparable to to other branches of other language family. Like for example, 
I don't know when you have uh, Germanic languages, for example, and then you have uh, I don't know Swedish and Norwegian and Danish, which are very similar, and then English, which is a bit more different. Or yeah, I guess it's a very broad <laughs> question. It's very hard to answer um, to give a very detailed answer. All right. Uh, let's move a little bit to another question. Let's take this one. Why did Finnish authorities not consider the honor uh, compatible with their vision of an ideal Finnish, Finnish society? Uh, were they not influenced by pan uh, oralic ideas uh, from uh, figures uh, uh, like Matthias uh, Kastren to be more lenient uh, towards other oralic peoples? Um, I mean, it was not about, I mean, it was about this general Finnish identity. So everything that was different just didn't fit into the picture. But it was, I mean, that was um, like the uh, the 19th century. Um, so yeah, with this just this general idea of the, like the general Finnish nationalism. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. We can move to another question. We don't have, unfortunately, much time. Yeah. Um, it is interesting. Do you speak any other Finno Greek languages than Estonian? I, I would say that I speak Finnish and Hungarian fluently. And I have some knowledge of other, I mean, of course, I, I speak some Sami, but I haven't practiced it as much. Um, and I have learned some more Finno languages as well, but um, of course, with the bigger languages, it's always easier to um, practice them because there's just more people. Like, um, yeah. I guess this question is also related to the next one. How many languages are required to learn during the program? Um, that's actually a good question because I don't know by heart. I think you have to check the program online. Um, yeah, we also will have virtual meetings with uh, program directors. So yes. a good question to leave for the virtual meeting as well. Like, I mean, you don't have a, to learn as many, many languages as I did that I know for sure. Um, uh, let's move to the next uh, one. Um, do you have any tips for people who want to become translators? Um, I mean, in general, you don't like it's good if you also have some kind of other background. Um, I mean, I personally, I only start, uh, studied linguistics and languages, but uh, many of the people who translate actually have uh, a background in a completely different field. And then you just additionally learn the language. And that's actually something very good. For example, if you um, have a background in some kind of technical field and you're able to um, translate this kind of technical text or um, or just any kind of <laughs> other other specialization actually comes in in handy as well. Um, other than that, I mean, I also I didn't uh, study translation studies either, so I basically just started translating because I I knew uh, the languages well enough. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will take unfortunately our last question because of the time. Uh, so can you be a teacher after this MA program, like the teacher of the Estonian as a foreign language? Um, yes, I think you can. But again, that's something that you should ask the program director because there's also other um, similar programs. So maybe there's one that would be more fitting even. Mm -hmm. So let's leave this question to the virtual meeting with the program yes. director then. All right, unfortunately, we have to wrap up our uh, webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Merit, for your interesting talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, for asking your questions. We are very sorry that we didn't manage to answer all of them. Uh, for those uh, who are interested to apply to the master's program um, in Estonian and Finno-Greek linguistics, uh, the application period is open, and you can apply before March 15th. Uh, so don't forget to submit your application in time. 
Also, we are going to host these virtual meetings that I already mentioned with the program director. So we are going to send you more information in the follow-up email together with the recording of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for being with us and I really hope to see you in Tartu.